Welcome, everyone. At least Terry and Randy, I see you're there. Uh, it's really nice to have you with us from Gardnerville, Nevada today. Um, I was looking at some of the CDC sites this morning, and in Washington State, we're doing really well. You can start to see the ep epidemiological curve descending now. And so we're waiting on our governor to make an announcement this week to see whether we're going to extend our stay-at-home order. He indicated last week that we probably will have it extended for um, maybe another couple weeks at least. He is releasing some things. We're opening up some things like you can go to parks now, state parks, and he opened up the construction industry to do some limited construction. So things are starting to change, but nationwide there's still hot spots like New York and Michigan and New Jersey, places where people are still contracting the illness and a lot of people still succumbing to death and families grieving. So when I started uh, doing noontime prayer in the Psalms, it was in response to Michael White, pastor of Gig Harbor. He had asked us to, sent me an email and asked me to join them in praying at noon each day for the pandemic. And so I agreed to do that. And then in a meeting with uh, Covenant pastors in our South Puget Sound District, along with Greg E., our superintendent, and Don Toyolo, who is one of the staff people in the conference office, they recommended reading the Psalms. And so I put those two together, and it gave birth to noontime prayer and the reading of the Psalms. I've really been enjoying this. It's been a good discipline for me to get into the Word and into the Psalms in a way that I normally wouldn't be studying it like this. I, I read through them, but I don't dig deep into them. So I hope you've been enjoying this, that it's feeding your soul and your spirit and your mind. And we're here to pray, so let's begin with prayer. Father, I just, I love the beauty of your creation, how it speaks your glory. Nebula and quasars, Stars, galaxies, superclusters, the moon, our own sun, all eman emanating light which you created. The heavens declare the glory, your glory. And I just give you praise. You are an awesome God. Without you, we are nothing, we have nothing. And we can do nothing. But with you, Lord, you have made us ambassadors of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the Spirit gives life. And I thank you that we are living today, not just temporally or temporarily, while we're on this earth. But for those of us who, who have believed in Jesus, who have been persuaded that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you are God in the flesh, that Jesus came, God in the flesh. That you have given us eternal life, and so we are living eternally now. And I give you praise for that as well. Father, as I think about this world, the earth on which we live, and all the peoples in so many different nations with so many different experiences, whether poverty or tyranny or cruelty or abundance as in Western Europe and in our, in our country, in Canada. And this virus has been a great leveler. It has brought the whole world to our knees. Economies have been sh shattered. Jobs have been lost. Finances have dried up. Food is starting to get scarce. And we have asked time and time again that you'd bring this epidemic quickly to a close, Lord. But more than that, and far more importantly than that, is that the work that you are intending to do by allowing this pandemic to continue, that that work would be accomplished, that your word would not return void that you might be wooing people by your love, waking us up out of our sin, 
waking us up out of our complacency, waking the church up out of our kingdom mentality, where we hold up, hold up in our building sometimes, Lord. Thank you that this comes as discipline to the church and love to the nations. I know families have lost their lives, precious lives uh, from amongst their own family members, Lord. And there's people grieving all around the world. And I don't pretend to understand why, Lord. For some who have been believers, you've called them home. To others, you've called them to that judgment. It has been appointed once for humankind to, to die, for human beings to die. Then comes judgment. So, Father, I pray that you would do whatever it takes to bring our nation and our world to its knees, that you would do whatever it takes to let us hear your clarion voice calling us home. Jesus' own words, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I pray that you would teach the world to come under the yoke of your grace, the yoke of your immeasurable love, the yoke of your understanding surpassing peace and the yoke of your eternal hope that you've given us in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you would bring this pandemic to an end, and yet beyond that and more than that, I pray that your will would be done. Not my will, not our will, Lord, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in our country. Your will be done in our states. Your will be done in our counties. Your will be done in the nations. And your will be done in our lives. Not as we will, but as you will, Lord. This is our heartfelt, fervent prayer. Bring about your will. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. <clears throat> Amen. So today we're looking at Psalm 19. There used to be a, sol a song, Don't You Wonder Why? Anyway, that was back in the 70s. We used to sing that one all the time. And it's an interesting psalm because there's two parts to the psalm. You'll hear it, actually three parts, but you'll hear a distinct change in the psalm. So there's been some debate over this, whether it was actually two psalms put together. Uh, I believe it was one psalm. So let's read it, and then we'll work through it verse by verse. <clears throat> psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. 
They're more desirable than gold. Yes, much, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warmed. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So we begin, again, I'll be reading from uh, the New American Standard Bible. I like this version because it's woodenly literal. It's not a very good reading version, but it's a wonderful study Bible because it follows the original languages so close. And so you get a good idea uh, as, as you study what the psalmist was intending and what the writers were intending. I liked reading the New Living Translation and the NIV and other translations, but this is a great study Bible. So Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14, again, we're told that for the choir director, it's a Psalm of David, and that would have been a, instructions again to the Levit Levitical choir. And whatever that meant, we don't know, but because it was a Psalm of David, it, that cued them into something, whether uh, tone to take or we don't know what that means. But And then getting into the meat of the Psalm, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. We don't see this so much anymore because of light pollution all around us. When the comet Kohotek was coming through, Nancy and I and the girls drove up towards Squim, and we found a very, very dark uh, spot on the road where there was a large gravel pullover. No lights anywhere around. It was pitch black other than the wonder of the Milky Way out. And then Kohotek came across the sky and it looked like a flashlight going across. It was beautiful. I think it was Kohotek, but it was beautiful. Uh, never seen anything like it. And the wonder of a Milky Way, declaring the glory of God, declaring his splendor. When the psalmist wrote this, when David wrote this, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. All they knew of the night sky was what they could see with their eyes which was marvelous, the wonder of the Milky Way and the planets and the moon and the sun. But since then, with the invention of this telescope and now with the Hubble telescope and even further improvements as we go, we are learning more and more about the known universe and how incredibly vast it is. Our Little planet is is situated in the galaxy in the um, solar system around our sun, which is located in one of the arms of the Milky Way galaxy, or between two of the arms of the Mil Milky Way galaxy, about halfway out in the in the galaxy, and our galaxy is situated among a local group of galaxies, and then that group of galaxies, with billions of stars in each galaxy, is situated within a uh, local cluster of galaxies, and that local cluster of galaxies is situated within a super cluster of galaxies. And then as far as the eye, eye or our telescopes can see are other super clusters of galaxies going on and on and on. It's enormous, the heavens are. And some of the stars, the size of them, beggar the imagination. They're so huge. And get this, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. And so there, there's that word telling, communication. They're communicating something to us. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. They're, it's again, teaching us something, declaring. That word refers to kind of uh, uh, instruction, teaching. So we get instruction from the heavens as we get out in the night sky and look, look up to the sky. Here in Bremerton at night, you can maybe spot the Big Dipper and Orion and Cassiopeia and the Swan, Cygnus the Swan and so on. But you can't really see the Milky Way here. It's, it's so much light pollution from the shipyard and from Seattle and in the city itself. And so we've, we've lost something. We've lost that speech that God is pouring out to us. And it says, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. I love that. The vastness of the universe is the, is the work of his hands. 
In one, other, when, in one other place, it says it's the delicate handiwork of his fingers, as one translation would have it, the delicate handiwork of his fingers. It's like God crocheted out the heavens. He knit it together, which makes God an incredibly big God. In one psalm, I think it was Psalm 8, the expanse of the heavens can be measured by the breadth of his hand. And again, it's teaching us something. Day to day, every day, it pours forth speech at night as we see those stars and the moon and the beauty of the, the Milky Way. And night to night, it reveals knowledge. And so there's this general knowledge that's being revealed from heaven. And it speaks to every human being on the planet. We've all been given the ability to see and to hear this knowledge and speech this declaration, this teaching, this telling that speaks of God's glory, his splendor, his incredible majesty, his power. And so it reminds me of, of the passage in Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Many scholars that I read think that this is where Paul got these ideas from, was from Psalm 19, and maybe from Psalm 8 too, but for, certainly from Psalm 19. So reading from Romans 1, 18 through 23, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So even though the heavens are pouring out this speech and are declaring the work of his hands, the wickedness of us as human beings is suppressing that truth. We, we don't want to hear it. It's like my going to God and saying, okay, what's your will, God? I, I'm listening. And yet we close our ears, we plug our ears. It goes on in verse 19 of Romans chapter 1, because that which is known about God is evident within them. So already within every human being, God has given us knowledge of him. There's no human being that has not been given that knowledge. Deep inside, we know that there's a God, we know that we're uh, held accountable to him. Our conscience bears that out. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So God is active in our lives, throughout our life, making it known inside of us that he is real and that he is there, calling out to us, wooing us, calling out to us with his love and with his grace. Yet so oftentimes our response is, I can't hear you, God. You're not speaking. Why? Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So now, according to Paul then, not only are the heavens declaring his glory and the stars and the galaxies and the Milky Way and the planets and the moon and the sun and the stars, but also everything that's been created reveals his eternal power and his divine nature. This is amazing. That means all of creation around us is declaring his glory, is declaring his power, is declaring his divine nature. We're without excuse. It's as plain as a nose on our face. So I thought about what some of these things that are declaring these things that he's made. And so I just want to take a moment and take a look at some of those things which he has made, which declare his eternal power and divine nature. I think of the beauty of mountain majesties or mountain majesty. The glory of being out in, in the wilderness in, in, with a range of mountains around you. So beautiful. Takes your breath away. Speaking of the glory of God, his eternal power that he made these things. Or o the ocean. I love going to the ocean. My wife and I, every year in December, our family goes to ocean shores. We sit up on the third floor watching the storms come in or hopefully have a couple sunny days where we, where we can watch the beautiful sunset. And it restores my batteries just seeing that incredible, beautiful, awe-inspiring scene of the ocean, which is so huge and vast speaking of the enormity of our God and the one who created it, and just the beauty of it, it's breathtaking. 
Or I love being in forests, the beauty of a forest, walking through the whole rainforest, or even on my mother's property when she had that piece of property down in Olympia, we'd walk down through the woods, and as we neared the creek, there would be a cedar grove. There was a large cedar grove that you would enter into, and it was so beautiful walking that deep scent of cedar and the sound of the brook, and then the more distant sound of the creek as it was rushing through the narrow part of the part of the creek. So beautiful, speaking of his eternal power and divine nature. What about rivers, the, the wild currents of a raging river? We love to go to Leavenworth and see Tumwater Canyon. We saw two kayakers go over the dam. I have it on my YouTube channel. Just amazing, the, the beauty all around us. The voice of the river speaking out glory, speaking out praise. Or placid, the placid waters of a lake. Reflection lakes are so beautiful. Or the intricate design of everything around us, of ferns and plants. You look at that and that's designed. That's incredible. Speaking forth again, praise and glory to God, reflecting the light that he made. Here's some grapes hanging from the branches, or hanging from the vine. All the produce we have, not just grapes, but cherries and apples and oranges and nectarines and pomegranates and my favorite persimmons and Japanese pear apples. He's given us such bounty with such in exquisite flavors all for our enjoy enjoyment and our delight he takes delight in providing us good things or the beauty of a rose i i grew roses for many years and finally gave up because they don't grow well in wet places but i had roses outside for about 15 years and i love growing them they were beautiful but not only are they beautiful with those concentric circles of petals which follows a certain mathematical formula that is also found in the in the spiral of a seashell and in the spiral of galaxies we find it all through creation this same mathematical principle and yet the fragrance of a rose too is is astounding made for our enjoyment speaking of his glory both through the light reflecting off the beauty of the colors of a rose, but also that incredible fragrance that we have. Or again, just the delicate handiwork of, of a small flower. It looks like some kind of orchid, I'm not sure, but it's beautiful. Or a butterfly's wings, so fragile. And the amazing transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly. When I was living in Japan and attending CAJ, in Tokyo at Higashi Kurume. In the springtime, there would be caterpillars all over the place, and I didn't like the caterpillars. But in due time, all those caterpillars would go into cocoons and they would come out beautiful butterflies. And then the whole playground would be flooded with butterflies flittering about. Such beauty. Nancy and I have gone over with the girls over to the Seattle Zoo where they have a butterfly house and gone in there and seen the incredible intricacy of the design on the on the wings and their ability to fly once having been a caterpillar it's just amazing or a bird in flight here's a pigeon who can say that this just happened by chance such exquisite design that took us thousands of years to figure out how we could get airborne yet these birds do it every day or the majesty and roar of a lion, or the innocence of a lamb. All these creatures all around us, even our dog, he's the most loving creature. He loves you even when you're bad. He always meets me at the door, excited to see me. Unconditional love. God has put unconditional love into our dogs. 
And then there's the power of lightning. I remember being in church down in Grace Community Covenant Church and Greg Oliver was preaching and he talked about God's power. And at that very moment, lightning crashed outside and the thunder immediately crashed. It was right on top of us. And everybody went, woo, Greg. But I love the lightning storms in Chicago. They would roll over and it would sound like a dynamite storm going over us. Nancy and I would sit in the windows and look up at the sky and see the sheet lightning and the bolts of lightning coming down and the incredible sounds of the thunder shaking our, our building. And just the beauty of the moon, which is hung just in the right place, which gives us the seasons, which is hung just in the right place so we have the tides. And the beauty of a full moon or my favorite, the beauty of a crescent moon or a harvest moon just coming above the, up above the horizon when it's that huge golden glow on it. All speaking of his eternal power and his divine nature. It's been clearly seen. Or sunsets. How many of you like to take sunset pictures? I remember when we were back in the film days, we would take whole ro rolls of sunset pictures. Now it's good we have digital cameras so we can just take them to our heart's content. They don't seem as important as, as they used to be, but I still love to take a sunset picture or a sunrise picture. And all of this declaring God's glory. And then finally, humankind. We are the pinnacle of creation. There's nothing more complex than human beings from our eyes to our blood clotting to our reproduction to the moment a baby uh, has their umbilical cord cut that releases a enzyme into the bloodstream that tells the body to close up the hole in the heart that's kept the lungs from uh, operating fully, just getting enough blood to, to develop. And when that enzyme is re released because of the cutting of the umbilical cord, that hole is closed up and we start taking our first breath. How did that ever come about just by chance? All around us, even when we, I look into the beauty of my wife's face or the beauty of her figure, it speaks forth his glory. It speaks forth his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And let, let me rephrase that. So we are without excuse. Every person on the planet can just open their eyes, look around them at the grass growing green, at our dogwoods out in the front yard, blooming brilliant white right now. They're so pretty. Uh, blueberry bushes in the backyard, seven blueberry bushes, all blossoming out now, ready to be turned into these wonderfully tasty blueberries, which we'll be enjoying this summer. It leaves the world without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they be became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts. Heart was darkened. So they, we delve into speculation, which is unknowable. Speculation is never knowable. Sometimes in Bible study, I have friends who like to speculate and I just warn them that's speculation. It, there's no grounding in that. There's no foundation in that. There's no ability to know truth through speculating. What we want to know is what scripture says, what the heavens are declaring to us, but also what scripture says. And then finishing up in Romans chapter one, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So we gave up the wonder and glory of the one who created all things. All this creation all around us, singing out praises to God continually with the sun bouncing off leaves, with the branches of trees dancing in the winds, the birds with their bird song and really God's song, all praising God. And we exchange that 
For a god in the image of corruptible man, or of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We saw idolatry in Japan. It's one of the most idolatrous nations in the world. Idols everywhere you go. But in some ways they don't hold a candle to us because we have our idol too. It's the idol of self. And as I've said before, our sacrifice is in like kind with our God. And so we sacrifice our own children through abortion. What foolishness to worship ourselves. What foolishness to worship human beings when we are so corruptible, so fickle, and we can become so evil. So again, it says above in the psalm, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. That word pours forth is the same word that was used of springs bubbling up. And so all over creation, uh, it bubbles up speech. It bubbles up knowledge and instruction. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is a measure of knowledge that we get from the general revelation of creation all around us. There is no speech, nor are there words. So just to make sure that we aren't, we aren't misunderstanding, he's not saying that there's real speech, that we can really hear words. It's discerned speech. It's discerned knowledge. It's intuitive speech speech. It's intuitive knowledge. But there is no speech, there, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. And so there's this conundrum here. There is this paradox that all along the heavens are declaring his glory and creation is singing out his praise. And yet the, there are actually no discernible syllables or no di discernible words. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the earth. So now returning to the first theme, their line, we're not sure exactly what that means. It's a word that can mean a musical note, like a sound. It can mean a, a string on a, a lyre or a stringed instrument. Uh, its primary meaning, meaning is a measuring rod, is a measuring device. So their ruler has gone out through all the earth. And so this knowledge that's being poured out on us, this teaching that's being poured out on us, it measures our lives. Meaning that we're held accountable by it. And there are utterances to the end of the earth, even though there's no words, but there still is knowledge being communicated of the glory of God and His divine power. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, meaning in them refers to the heavens, refers to the galaxies and the stars and the moon and the planets. And within that canopy of the heavens, he has placed a tent for the sun. I love the poetic imagery that David uses here. What a poet David was, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. There's two thoughts on this. One is he's coming out of his bridal chamber in the morning. We won't go there, full of joy. But the other idea is that he is a bridegroom coming out of his own chamber, headed for the wedding. And I think that's what it actually means. He's headed for the wedding and nothing can deter his course. And so the sun every morning comes out joyful, uh, such brilliant, beautiful light. I know living in the North Pacific, in January and February, I tend to suffer from sad seasonal affective disorder. I get very gloomy and with all the rain and the gray weather. And yet when the sunshine comes out in April, May, and June, and you get these beautiful days, the flowers are blooming. I have a saying, we put up with nine months of misery for three months of paradise. Well, that's the idea here is that this bridegroom is coming out of his chamber, going to meet his bride and nothing can stop him. He's gonna continue his, his route. And then it again, it says it in another way, it rejoices as a strong man to run at his course. The sun rejoices as a strong man running on his path. Nothing can deter him. He's going to make it to his destination. And every day the sun has a circuitous route. Actually, we know that it's, that's the, only the appearance of it. 
we know that we are going around the sun and that's what makes that appearance. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. Now that's an odd thing to say. No matter where you are on the planet, even way north in Alaska, when the sun shines, there's still heat that you can feel on your skin. You can feel, still feel that heat. Nothing is hidden from the heat. So that's an illusion that's carrying us over to the second half of the psalm. The first half, half was all about this general revelation about creation speaking the glory of God, speaking out praises to God, speaking out that knowledge, pouring out that instruction. And now it's saying there's nothing hidden from its heat, meaning there is no one without excuse. Is that right? There is no one without excuse, right? And now we make the transition. And so just as nothing can be hidden from its heat, nothing can be hidden from the law, the law of God, from the word of God. So now we transition into speaking of not just general revelation, but the actual words. Whereas in the first part of the psalm, there was no words, there was no speech. Now we do have words. We have the very word of God. And he gives us a bunch of attributes about his law, about the word. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And so as we look into the pages of the law, it restored the Israelite soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Certainly, the, the, the pages of the Hebrew scripture are, are still valuable, extremely valuable for understanding who God is, what that moral standard that he has set it uh, is. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The Proverbs help us make, become wise. The Psalms help us become wise. It goes on, it says, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Precepts have to do with kind of the guidelines of the law, those precepts within the law. Not so much the commandments, but those teachings within the law that give us instruction. They're right. And notice that the precepts of the Lord, and up above, it's Lord and Lord, all in capital letters, so we know we're talking about Yahweh, about Jesus. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. So someone who is really loving God, when, it, when they are encountered with the law, they don't turn from it. It brings them joy in their hearts. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the, the eyes. Now we're talking about literally about the commandments, the Ten Commandments and the 613 commandments that the Jewish people had, the Hebrew people had uh, deduced from the law, from the pages of the Torah. The command of the Lord is pure. There's nothing adulterating it. It's pure, enlightening of the eyes. Paul calls the law holy, righteous, and good in Romans. Same kind of idea. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is not just fear of punishment. That's not the meaning of this word. It's reverential fear. It's reverential fear when you're up on Mount Rainier and you realize how dangerous this mountain can be and how magnificent this mountain can be. Or when you're standing at the ocean or, or even swimming in the ocean, how careful you need to be. There's a reverential fear of things that are so powerful and majestic. And in the same way, we have a reverential fear of the Lord. It's clean. And that reverential fear, that awestruck wonder of who God is, endures forever. We will be awestruck throughout all eternity at who God is. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. So the judgments, again, have to do those with those precepts, the commandments, that judge between what is right and what is wrong. This behavior is sin. This behavior is, a, as, is an abomination to the Lord. And so we have judgments made on our behavior, on what is right, what is wrong, what is sin and what is not. The law didn't leave too much to the imagination or too much for discussion on what is wrong and what is right. It makes it very clear. There's a few discrepancies here where we can argue about whether a certain behavior is sin. But overall, we know 
and our conscience bears with us. The judgments of Yahweh, of Jesus, are true. They are righteous altogether. They're always right judgments. They're just judgments. They're never adulterated. They're never unfair. And they're never unjust. They're more desirable than gold, than much fine gold. Gold was the most valuable metal known, known to them at that time. And the words of God is what it's getting at. The very speech being poured out through his word is more desirable than gold. Sweeter also than honey in the drippings of the, honey, of the honeycomb. The Hebrew people loved honey. In fact, that was part of the promise of God that you will uh, receive a land flowing with milk and honey. I love honey too. I can't eat it right now because of my illness. But I love honey and tea and uh, honey on bread with butter. You mix it together and make a, a honey butter sandwich. Ooh, such sweetness given to us by God. And yet more sweet than the honey is the words of God himself. And here, speaking of the law and of those five books of the law. In David's time, he lived in, he reigned from 1011 through about 970 AD for nine, actually nine he reigned for 31 years, or 40 years exactly, So, but he started his reign in 1011 BC. And so at that time, there wasn't a lot of books written. There wasn't Kings, there wasn't Samuel written, because it's about David's life. Uh, I don't know if Judges had been written yet, maybe it had. But basically, you had the five books of the law was David's Bible. And he's saying those words of God that not only declare this kind of unknowable, unknowable speech, but clear speech that tells us what is right, what is wrong, how to live. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Now at this point I go, well, that was true for the Hebrew people within their covenant uh, made by Abraham and by Moses. But what about us? Moreover, by them your servant is warned. Yes, this, the law still warns us. And it warns us because there's consequences to our sin. We forget that. Even as Christians, there are consequences to our sin. If we persist in a particular behavior and sin, it will, we will reap the consequences. We can't expect God to remove those consequences from us. Sometimes he does out of grace. But oftentimes he lets us reap the full meal deal. We go, what are you doing, God? And he goes, no, what are you doing, Grant? And then in keeping them is great reward. Now I start getting a little not nervous because none of us are able to keep the law. When we had the Promise Keepers movement, I always was uneasy with the Promise Keepers movement because all I see is the Promise Breakers movement. Those seven promises made, so many ma men rushed into making those promises only to find that they couldn't keep them and leaving them in a greater dis place of discouragement always failing at living the Christian life, always failing at living up to the moral standard of the law. Well, they had a limited revelation at that point. There was still more revelation to come. And so to that end, I've shown this before, this graph, but on the left you have the Old Covenant, on the right you have the New Covenant. On the Old Covenant, it was situated around the person of Moses, who through angels was mediated the law, the angels were the mediators of the law to Moses. And then you have Jesus, God in the flesh, who didn't need a mediator. He was speaking the words of God. He is the lawgiver, Yahweh. And then on the left, you have the law, which was an external rule that we had to keep. On the right is grace and truth, God's actions, the Holy Spirit's actions, and Jesus' actions, and his words, grace and truth. Not the same thing. Grace and truth are two separate things. Grace is Jesus telling the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Truth is saying, go and lead your life of sin. Grace and truth. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Under the law, you had to do it by works. There were the works of the law. Under the new covenant, it's all by faith. Romans says, from faith to faith. John says, we've all received of his fullness, grace upon grace, or literally grace 
after grace. I've likened to the ocean waves of his grace. Under the law, you had to do it by your own ability, by your flesh, by your own insight, by your own strength, by your own discipline and your own effort. And we know that that's impossible. None of us have been able to keep the law. Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 5 and says, You've heard it written, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that any of you who has looked after a woman with lust in his heart, he's already committed adultery in his heart. And I would say the same thing for women, that any of you women who have looked after another, another man with lust in your heart has committed adultery in your heart. And it goes on to talk about calling people stupid. You're in danger of hellfire. None of us can keep it. No one is righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks God. Together, we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so, whereas we had the, work, the works of the law by the flesh in the Old Covenant, in the New Covenant, we live into grace and truth by or through faith by the power of the Spirit. And so now everything is external to us in the sense that our transformation, our, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, all come from God himself. The lie of lies, that they exchange the truth of God for the lie has now been unearthed. And we're back to being just creatures, not worshiping self, not thinking, thinking that we can produce anything acceptable to God. All of our adequacy is from God. Everything we have is from God. He says, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so all of our nothingness amounts to nothing. And we look to the spirit to be our everything, to be our all in all. And lastly, the ministry of in death, the ministry of death engraved with letters on stone. We know that at the giving of the law, 3,000 people died. In the New Covenant, you have the ministry of the Spirit written on tablets of human hearts, and that ministry of the Spirit gives life. At the giving of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people came to life. Such a vivid picture of the reality of living under the law and the reality of living under the Spirit. Is there still things to be learned from the law? Of course. It's the foundation upon which the New Testament is built. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that... Um, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for, rebu for reproof, for rebuke, and for training in righteousness. And the Hebrew scriptures was a, was a scripture of their day. So Paul was saying that scripture is yet inspired and we have much to learn from it. So please don't hear me taking away from the law. As we've been doing our Bible study on the discipleship of grace, we've been looking through the book of Genesis and every page of the book of Genesis drips with the grace of God. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all, and, and the brothers, the, the 12 sons, all bumblers, all men who are chasing after their own design, making contingencies, not believing God, not trusting him. And their failure is pronounced all through the book. And yet behind the scenes is God's faithfulness in spite of incredible wickedness on their part to keep his promise to them. And it was such reassurance of truth for me and for those in our Bible study to know that we don't have to look to ourselves, but we look to God's faithfulness and keeping his promise. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who has made us adequate to be servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, for the letter kills, but of the Spirit, for the Spirit gives life. Who can discern his errors? David is asking this question. Acquit me of hidden faults. He's saying the law can do that. Well, now we have the Spirit. Who can discern? Who can convict us of our er errors? Not just an external law, but the very lawgiver who has come to live within. I've maintained for many, many years that to sin as an unbeliever was miserable. But to sin as a believer is exquisitely miserable. Because not only do you have your conscience and the consequences of the sin, but you also have that convicting presence of the Holy Spirit telling us that's wrong. So many of us have developed callous ears. 
by saying, I can't hear you, Lord. We, we kind of block them off. When I was being an aggressive driver, I blocked God off in that part of my life. Just didn't hear him, didn't want to hear him. Until finally I asked him to cure me, and he did by having me pulled over after a very aggressive moment of driving. He took my fingers out of my ears. How are you putting your fingers in your ears right now? How are we running from God? Where is it in your life? He's speaking to you at this moment. And the Spirit is saying, time to take care of this. Time to let me, by my Spirit, put it to death. Ask Him. Ask Him to put it to death in you. Be courageous. Be brutally honest. Who can discern his errors? Equip me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. That word presumptuous is, is akin to prideful sins. I thought it was sins that I just presuming on God. That's not what the word means. It's a word that means those sins that come out of our pride. Where we don't need God. I can do this myself. I can produce a righteousness acceptable to him. Man, I've been such a good person. It just amazes me. Even me, it amazes me. I've been so good. And you're thinking, oh, this is painful my, to my ears even to listen. Of course, none of that is true. We all struggle with the sin of pride. It's the human condition. I've been asking for years for God to put away pride in my life. And yet it's ug ugly voice still haunts me. And I know it's ugly voice still haunts you. It's what makes life as human beings so difficult. We're all like porcupines on a cold winter night who try to huddle together for warmth. But when we get too close to each other, our quills hurt, our pride hurts, our one-upmanship, all that kind of one-upmanship, all that kind of bad behavior we can fall into then drives us away and we're always huddling together and being driven away. Let them not rule over me my presumptuous sins that I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. David had no knowledge of the cross yet. We have this wonderful knowledge, a much further and deeper revelation of the heart of God who would give up his son to die for us on the cross. And so the new covenant, whereas the old covenant poured forth the word of God and it even spoke of the cross and of the resurrection, but in very limited ways. Now the new New Covenant and the documents of the New Covenant pour forth such incredible speech, such incredible good news. I was told all my life, you better be reading the Bible, you better re be reading the Bible. My father used to tell me, I can tell you what kind of Christian you are, Grant, by how much time you spend reading the Bible and how much time you spend praying. Son, I don't see you doing these things. You're not much of a Christian. And the more he would say that to me, he said that to me frequently, the more he would say that to me, the more of an aversion I got to reading Scripture just difficult to read, read the Bible for me. Finally, in seminary, I called out to God and God said to me this rather shocking thing in my spirit. He said, Grant, if you never read the Bible again, if you never pray again, you're mine and I'll never let you go. And by speaking those words into my spirit, he gave me the freedom not to read, but he also gave me the freedom to read. And I started reading this book and I'm wondering, and sometimes I wonder at the people who tell me I better be reading it all the time if they've ever read it themselves. Because it is such good news. It puts to death legalism. It puts to death licentiousness. There's no room for human pride or for human religion. There's just this wild dance with our Creator. This love affair with our Creator where He leads and we follow in this wonderful dance of life. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression, we will be presented blameless before his presence with glory. And we've already been acquitted of our transgressions and of our sins and our, and our iniquities, those group family sins. We've been acquitted of them. We've been justified by the cross of Jesus and by our entrusting our life to him. One meaning of the word believe, but also by believing, by being persuaded that he is Again, the Messiah, the one who died for us on the cross, who took my place and took your place, but also who is God in the flesh, the one through whom all things were created, the one in whom all things hold together. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. A rock, my rock and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. So he's saying just everything I've just said, let these words be acceptable to you, these meditations. And I think whereas we can meditate on the law and gain value from it, of course, but we can meditate on grace. In 2 Peter, it says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we meditate on Jesus, and we meditate on the giver of the law, and we may meditate on his kindness and grace and love and peace, and that he was for the most broken people, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done in life, he loves you resolutely. He does not turn his back on you. He will rescue you. He will redeem you. He will restore your soul. He will lead you back onto the, the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for we know that the Lord is with us. He's promised us, I will never leave you nor, nor forsake us. Even in the presence of our enemies, he's prepared a table for us. Our cup overflows. He has anointed our head with the oil of joy and the oil of healing. Our cup overflows. We're full of joy in his presence. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. How blessed are we in the new covenant? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We've been given everything we need for godliness in Christ Jesus. And it's all in Jesus Christ, all in him. None of us and all of him. So we need to just learn to stop looking at ourselves and to look to him in everything and for everything. Proverbs 3, 5, and 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in Jesus with all your heart. And do not lean on your own insight or your own understandings. But in all your ways acknowledge him. And literally, it's not just acknowledge. It's the word to know, like a man knows his wife. You get the drift. In all your ways, know him. Know his heart. And he will make straight your paths. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David knew that his righteousness was centered on the rock of, of the Lord, of Yahweh. He didn't know it was Jesus yet. He knew it would be a, one of his descendants eventually. And my redeemer, that word redeemer means one who would go into a slave market. It's a wonderful Hebrew pic picture again. They th thought in pictures, a man who would go into a slave market and purchase a slave for full price, make the payment so that the, it's, the slave has been bought, and then set the, the slave free. We have been set free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not, again, submit yourselves to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back under the law when we are under grace and truth. Don't go back under the flesh when we have the Spirit. He is our rock. He is your rock. He is your redeemer. I pray that you, would, you have found redemption in him and that he is that rock upon which your life is built, not the shifting sands of your own effort, your own righteousness, your own religion. He is our all in all. He is our all in all. And to him goes all honor, glory, and praise. So as you get a chance, go out, Take a walk this afternoon outside if it's uh, nice where you are and take a, a look, a good long look at the beauty of creation and let that speech pour forth, that praise, all of creation. I hear it now so clearly and see it now so clearly. All of creation praising him at every moment. Let that speak to you and then take time to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ to get to know him intimately. Well, thanks for joining me today. Psalm 19, it's a wonderful psalm, contrasting that unknowable speech, and yet the, the knowable speech, and yet it's not really speech, but the knowledge we get from creation all around us, and yet that sure knowledge from the law, and now in our context, the even surer and better knowledge of the new covenant by which we live, by which we've been forgiven, by which we've been graced, by which we've been redeemed. Let's pray. 
Father, again, I look at the glory of your heavens. They pour out speech. They declare your glory. Day to day, they pour out forth speech. And night to night, they reveal knowledge. They declare the work of your hands. What glory and majesty is yours, Lord? Give us ears to hear the creation around us. Give us eyes to see. Not that in of themselves they have glory. They only reflect the glory of the Creator, like mirrors all around us, reflecting your eternal power and your divine attributes. Thank you for quasars and for nebula, for stars and planets and galaxies, for the constellations, for Cassiopeia, for Orion, the Big Dipper, Cygnus, the Swan. But more than that, thank you for not only the law, but more so for the speech in the New Covenant. Your words are spirit and they are life. Thank you that for the hope that you've given us, not in the mere sacrifice of blood and bulls and goats, but in the once and for all time sacrifice of the most precious blood of your son, Jesus. Thank you for cleansing our lives. Thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us life when none of us deserved it. I never thought I'd live beyond 26, Lord, and here I am 59 years, 36 years later, and still breath in my lungs, still with a beating heart, still with the speech that you gave me back to declare your glory. I pray for years ahead when I can continue to proclaim your grace, your glory, your goodness, your compassionate heart, your kindness to every human being on the face of the planet, Lord. I pray that for everyone that you would keep us safe, that that word would be breaking into our inner inner being, Lord, for those places where we have been hiding out, hiding out in our shame, hiding out in our stuff, that you by your spirit would expose us, Lord. And you would bring us to, into a greater place of freedom, into a closer dance with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for joining me today for noontime prayer and the reading of Psalm 19. I'll be back tomorrow at 11.55 with a countdown so you can get connected. And then we'll be reading Psalm 20. And then again on Thursday, Psalm 21. And then the big one on Friday, Psalm 22, which is a prophecy of, of the Messiah, the coming Messiah. Thanks again. I close with a blessing from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be, be preserved, complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. And he also will bring it to pass. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen.